and welcome. It's This Is Going Well, I Think, with David Cooper. I am David Cooper. It's This Is Going Well, I Think, the show where no one's listening, no one cares. The show where every episode's the last episode. Today's lineup is fantastic. It's packed with action. Some people would even say it's action-packed. In under 10 minutes, science expert and biologist specializing in bats, Dan Riskin, is going to tell us about Viking body modifications that were newly discovered and frog microevolution. Does that sound exciting to you? Nerd. Then it's everything technology related with Carmi Levy, including how the younger generation does not give a care if influencers that they're seeing on social media are actual people or AI bots. And finally, we'll catch up with comedian Natasha Vinnick, a friend of mine who's currently playing in the Netflix is a joke festival. But way more importantly than that, she's all backed up. She hasn't pooped in a week, I think. I'm looking forward to drilling into that. But first, this. Story, story, stories. On to the stories of the day. This first one deals with the nation of Canada's favorite adorable animals, Trash pandas, raccoons, and while the fear of rabies is maybe the most terrifying thing you can think of that has to do with raccoons, I've got an even more hair-raising, even more chilling story for you. Raccoons have gone full zombie. I kid you not, those furry little critters, those masked banditos, are catching a virus called canine distemper virus, and that may well cause their temper to distemper. And by distemper, I'm talking extras from the Michael Jackson thriller video. I read an interview with some bigwig in the wildlife control world. He's a CEO of a company that gets rid of unwanted critters that's just too funny not to name. The company's called Skedaddle Wildlife. And this dude says raccoons infected with CDV, canine distemper virus, get up on their hind legs, bare their teeth, and growl. Kind of like my mom used to do when I'd switch the channel from Young and the Restless as a kid. Now, if you see one of these zombie raccoons, and no, it's not some party monster stumbling home after a night out, do not try to pet or relocate them. I repeat, do not try to pet and relocate them. You'd be better off petting a porcupine. Now, raccoons infected with CDV are not just out for a midnight stagger. They're really sick, and there's currently no vaccine for them. In Toronto, Animal Services is so swamped with calls about these poor critters, they don't know what to do. And alas, roadkill service requests have shot up dramatically in that city. And if that wasn't enough, the raccoons are not following the rules of the road. They're playing around in traffic way more than usual. Oh, and just when you thought it couldn't get any worse for our furry friends, there's also a spike in rabies because, well, why stop at one terrible illness? Quebec is throwing vaccine baits out of planes like they're trying to win stuffed animals at a carnival game to try to address the rabies problem. So if you do accidentally get scratched by one of these raccoon zombies, you might want to rush to get a rabies shot as well. And I know the question that's burning for you. Can humans get canine distemper virus? As it stands, it's currently not well understood whether raccoons can pass it to people. And by that, I mean they definitely cannot pass it to people. Just makes the story more fun for me to tell you that you can become a zombie from raccoons. You can't. So remember, if you see a raccoon acting like it just came out of a nightclub at 3 a.m., all messed up, it's not auditioning for a zombie TV show. It's just nature reminding us that every creature can have its bad days and get bad illnesses. So stay safe. Don't pet the wildlife. And I hope no more of my updates will scare the living daylights out of you. Let's keep it in Canada for this next one, and you're going to hate me. What could be worse than cheesy puns? Cheesy cheese puns! Let's go all the way up the northeastern coast, all the way to Newfoundland. To yesterday night, Thursday night, where things got a little dicey. Or should I say slicey, when a very upset man decided to take out his anger in a somewhat unconventional way. You see, he didn't just throw a tantrum, he threw a block of cheese at police officers who came knocking on his door. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Was it a sharp attack? Unfortunately, police did not specify whether it was a sharp cheddar or just a mild-mannered mozzarella. Yeah, that's right. Shitty puns and alliteration. And let's be honest here, people. Assaulting police with cheese, that's no Gouda. (laughs) I hate myself. Now, the officers responding were called because of a disturbance, but I bet you they never anticipated Derry to be any part of the danger. The man in question charged with assault, assaulting a police officer, and breach of probation. 
Sort of like a Swiss Army knife of misdemeanors, but a Swiss Army knife where one of the tools was a cheese slicer. Nah, that one was a reach. The man was taken to a lockup facility, probably to prevent him from grating on anyone else's nerves. And while there was no reports of any officers injured, I guess you could say this man took the notion of food fight to a whole new level. A criminal level. And for my final slice of bad punnery here, if you're going to pick a weapon in Newfoundland, cheese might not be your best choice. Cheese is not a weapon that's going to allow you to breeze past police. Get it, Bree? Let's be honest, it's not the kind of culture the police appreciate. Get it? Culture? Cheese culture? So remember, be sharp or you'll find yourself in a real pickle. Or should I say cheese wheel? What I'm most proud of in summarizing this story is I did so for maybe a 20-word report. No longer than a tweet. How's that for content? Content that's high in milk fat. Because cheese has a lot of milk fat in it. I don't know. All right, are you ready? Let's bring on science educator, bat biologist, former host of Daily Planet on the Discovery Channel, Dan Riskin. He wants to talk about some wacky new, exciting discoveries around Viking body modifications that might ache you out. But I'm just going to try to derail him. So Dan Riskin in a moment. Daniel Riskin, science educator, science communicator, biologist of bats, bat of biologist. Yeah, let's talk about bats. Well, you know what? I want to talk to you about bats. Do you know that there are bats that have little tridents on their noses? Like the chewing gum? Not the chewing gum, like the thing that, that uh, Neptune holds. Oh, like the pitchfork, the three-pronged pitchfork. Uh, the pitchfork with three dents, yeah, the trident. The, there's a, a group of bats called the hippocytorids. They have these uh, great what are called nose leaves. So these bats echolocate out their nose. They have this big flap of skin in, on the face that is uh, is modified to work as sort of, sort of like a megaphone to send the sound out where it goes and so they can echolocate. But a bunch of these bats, these hippocytorids, have three flaps of skin at the top of the nose leaf that's shaped like a trident. They're called the trident leaf nose bats. Now, I saw one once. I've seen one once in Israel. And uh, I blew my mind, a cellia tridens, it was called, and it was white, and it had this beautiful trident nose leaf, and I would ju- it was the first time I'd ever seen a bat in that family, the Hippocytoridae, and I just, I, I just, I will never forget it. It was, it filled my heart with so much joy, but there are a bunch of other ones that live in other parts of the world that have these tridents, and nobody knows really what the deal is, like, why the trident? Why, why would that evolve? Is it... It's in the, as far as I know, it's in the males and the females, so it's probably not like some kind of adornment to attract the other sex. So what the heck is it? Is it possible it's just accidental? Like it wasn't no. selected for in nature, but it was a mutation and that bat that had the mutation got lucky and, you know, had sex with a bunch of other bats and... Yeah, it's possible. But you, I mean, you have to think that something that nice and structured would go away over time if it weren't being selected for, right? You, you'd, you'd think that a, a structure that sort of is symmetrical and looks nice, if you don't if, if evolution is not selecting for it, you expect it to kind of go away over time and become kind of amorphous and blobby and, and not to be preserved. But it's really, it's really distinct and they're different in the different species. Like the, some of them, they're like little spears and other ones are like lobes. And uh, they're, yeah, so my, my gut instinct is that they must do something. One possibility is that it helps shape the sound that's going out. Another possibility is that it does something to the sound as it's coming back. Um, but I don't know any of that. And in some leaf nose bats do sort of move their face when they make the sound to sort of like they twitch it as they make the sound and that probably affects something about the frequencies that are going out in the direction in which they go um but uh but the the, the role of the trident is a mystery of bat science wow an um, unsolved bat science mystery that i think is relevant to everybody's life i think everybody on this listening to this show right now can think of a time where they personally were affected by the trident leaf nose bats uh strange trident nose leaf before we started talking we were talking about filling time on commercial radio and how you might find that difficult if you had like a four-hour show you're thinking to yourself i don't know what to say and now i realize this is why you shouldn't do long format radio oh can you imagine a four-hour show that i hosted could you imagine what that would be like it'd be like well now that we've talked about the trident leaf nose bat let's take a moment to talk about the sword nose bat of central and south america now this is a totally different bat obviously it's not a hippocytorid it's in a different family called the phylostomidae which convergently has evolved nasal echolocation and convergently has flaps on the nose but this one the sword nosed bat has a huge nose leaf that is one giant spear that sticks up 
way up above its head and is about as tall as its ears. And so, like, if I had a nose that big, I mean, it would be as big as a ruler. Can like, you it's, stop? It's a- I mean, you just keep going and going like the Energizer Bunny. Anyway, if you had to do a four-hour radio show, it would be called Dan Riskin's Bat Nasal Echolocation Hour for four hours. That would be your show. <laughs> Yeah, and it'd be and it'd be, that's a good name for it because you can't hear echolocation and nobody wants to listen to my show. So mm-hmm. that's like a perfect perfect call. I, I I did sort of recycle a joke. My my girlfriend Miranda does radio occasionally at an event we go to in the desert. Burning Man, not important, but she does a radio show every year. Yeah, the the radio station just gives her one because she's my girlfriend and she volunteers at the radio station. This that and the other. Um, and she plays ABBA, but it's a two hour slot, so she calls it the ABBA Power Hour for two hours. That's the name of the show. I just thought Dan Dan Riskin's Echo Location Hour for four hours would be. Yes, I see. I even missed it when you were talking. I was so worked up about the Echo Location piece of it. I missed the the uh, the disconnect between the number of hours and the name of the show. Apologies. It's okay. Dan, do you have any tattoos? You do. I do. You got? Do a, you have any tattoos? I do. Yeah, I got some. Yeah, I just saw my, one. Yeah, you just moved it in front of the camera. There yeah, it is. I was just showing off my ink. I got yeah, a bunch. Could you put your pants back up before we keep going? Because my uh, pants it's are on. I'm thinking of undoing my button though. These jeans are feeling a bit tight. I had a lot do of it. ice cream last night. Uh, I don't have any piercings. Do you? Uh no. Well, yeah, no. I pierced my ears when I was uh, like a uh, teenager, um, but they've grown back. Okay. When I was 16 or 17, one of my friends pierced his ears with a paper clip. When we were out drinking Jeepers. and he got like a blood infection, ended up in the hospital, like almost died. And I think to this day, his immune system is a little wonky because of that incident. Wow. So was this his first foray into dangerous behavior? It seems like somebody that would stick a paperclip through their ear might that, I mean, either that's a total outlier, like somebody that's pretty straight laced, just one day sticks a paperclip through their ear, or there's a scenario where that's somebody who's a bit of a risk taker. Thus the immune system problems might be related to other things they have done in their risky behavior times. Could be, could be. He was kind of like the, you know, the TV show movie Jackass. He was that member of the friend group, so maybe. Uh, Okay. Okay, I set the stage. I asked you about tattoos. I asked you about piercings. Have you made modifications to your front teeth for aesthetic reasons? No, I have not, uh, but the Vikings did. Oh. There's a, a new paper out about this thing that Vikings did, and I didn't know they did this, and it makes me so, it is the grossest thing I can, like getting a tattoo, fine, getting your ears pierced, fine, piercing your ear with a paperclip, not a love it, but filing your front teeth so there are horizontal grooves in your teeth, like imagine a horizontal line that goes across your four front teeth parallel across all of them that is like a nice straight line that's filed in there by some kind of like tattoo artist slash tooth filer and then when you smile everybody can see that line there that's what these a whole bunch of viking skeletons have this they're all males that have done this but nobody can figure out what it's for and so there's this new paper trying to like come up with guesses about what it has to do with but there are hundreds of them and i just can you imagine like what happens if it hits a nerve I mean, it's a Viking. Aren't these people notoriously, notorious warriors? Can't they deal with the pain? Yeah, I guess so. I'm not a Viking, though. That's one thing we learned today is that I, it, so there's a whole bunch of them on what's called Gotland. It's an island off of, that's now part of Sweden. There's a bunch of skeletons there that have this. And they think maybe it has, like, so there are a couple things. One, it's always males. Two, there's one graveyard where there are a bunch of people buried on their backs in graves by themselves and none of them have it but then there's this other place where a whole bunch of people are buried together and they all do have it and so it's thought that maybe people who lived in that town got buried nicely but people who were buried over in the corner over there were just people passing through when they died or something like that and if so maybe those tooth markings are on people that were passing through so maybe they were like traveling merchants or something so they made up this whole scenario about like maybe a merchant is like a member of the guild and maybe they file their teeth when they join the guild as like a, a right or something like that and then when you meet one of these people and you're not sure if they're really from the guild or not they can flip up their lip and show you their teeth and then you're like oh yes you are a member of the guild like the whole thing is just sort of like crazy and i really it makes me not want to travel back in time to viking times because it's scary yeah yeah i wonder how the air would taste back then because we got so much pollutants in the air now yeah like if we took a cave person see i don't want to be sexist cave person and put them here would they just start caught like if i brought a caveman to manhattan the disgusting air with the cars and the manufacturing and the would they just start coughing and be like oh how can you breathe this garbage probably for a minute but i mean we kind of do that every time like somebody from 
the countryside of South America travels to India and goes to Delhi in the middle of the summer when the air quality is garbage, like they notice it right away. But then people who live in Delhi, like they get used to it. So I, yeah, I think in the short term, yes. But I also think, I don't know, man, like if you went back in time to when that air was so nice, but then you got a sore tooth, you'd die. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no antibiotics. Like, oh, you're in pain? Well, we could hit you with this club or you could go chew on the bark of that tree, which we think might help a little bit, or we could burn this rabbit for you and pray. But, you know, like... I, yeah, I or no like you, you get cut with a knife, need stitches? No, you're not getting stitches. Just No kinda... stitches, and good luck with the infection. I hope your immune system's up for that because yeah. there's just, no antibiotics. What did they do with cuts? They just held the skin together for a week with their fingers? You like... know, I heard once that in... I don't know if this is true, but somebody did tell me this, that army ants, which have these great big, huge mandibles, they used to use those to hold a, a wound shut. So what they would do is they'd hold the ant over the the cut. It would bite, and that would just like hold the two flaps together. Then they would rip the body off the head, and the head would just hold it <laughs> shut. I don't know if that's true, but I hope it is. Wild. That's wild. So couldn't it just be like the lower class people, the people not worthy of individual burial get thrown in a grave and also we're going to mark their teeth to show them that they're lower class couldn't it be something like that or we're vikings more egalitarian or we don't know yeah i i don't know i know that much i mean there's probably somebody that could tell you why that idea doesn't hold with the evidence that's out there but that, i like the way you're thinking of other possibilities the other thing they mentioned in the paper or at least in the the parts that i read was about how a lot of these are associated with places that were known to be uh merchant areas like places where they sold a lot of stuff but i think your point holds like it might have been a social class or it could be the other end of the social class where it was like you know if you were fancy dancy you got to file your teeth but um that doesn't really fit with them being buried in the corner of the graveyard in a big plump but maybe that was like the nice way to be buried yeah you get to, you get to hang out your with friends. your friends in the afterlife yeah, hey. as, a, as opposed to these loners they gotta be alone yeah They're oh not a- you're so poor we'll bury you by yourself in your own grave and give you lots of space but we're rich so we get buried in a big pile of people Face down. Sounds fun to me. Okay, Dan Riskin's here. We're going to be back to talk more science. Daniel Riskin. Hello. Hi. Oh, I like when you sing. I do like when you sing. I've been singing a lot this week on the show for no good reason. Or was that last week? Who knows? Oh, who could tell anymore? But you're singing, and I love it. it makes me want to sing. Dan, you've got some fun stories to talk about. Yeah, I do. We want to talk about evolution. I always see these uh, creationists talk about microevolution and macroevolution as if it's a real thing. They're like, oh, yeah, dogs being bred to change a little every generation. That's microevolution. That works. But you can't have one species evolve into another because the world's only what, how many thousand years old, etc. Six. No. But it can happen fast, it can happen right before our eyes. Yeah, evolution can happen very fast. And this story takes us to the frogs, Dan. It does take us to the frogs, my good friend. So there is a paper out about salt in ponds. So when it's winter in North America, we deal with that by putting salt on the roads because then it makes the water, the ice melt into water and then it evaporates or whatever and then it's gone and then the roads are clear. And the salt is good for the roads, but it's kind of bad because that water you know, runs off to the side and then the salt goes into the ponds and then there are things living in those ponds apparently and they don't do well with salt because it's like a fish that lives in the salt water will die if you put it in the fresh water. And if you take a freshwater animal and you put it in the salt water, it'll probably die there too. Like we're mammals, so we don't really care. Like for us, we just hold our breath and swim in the water. But like if you're a fish, how much salt there is in the water will either pull water out of your body or shove water into your body and it's going to make a huge difference so the fact that a a salmon can swim from the ocean up a stream that's fresh water like its whole physiology has to radically change when it makes that transition like it's a really big deal so this is all to say that when we put salt in ponds where all these freshwater species live it's usually not good for them especially if it's a small pond and all this salt from the road goes into a little small pond the concentration goes way up And so one of the things that people have been trying to figure out is like, what happens to the ecology of these places? Is it bad for the animals? What's happening? And so this study was on wood frogs and they were looking at a bunch of different ponds in, I think it was Illinois. And they measured the salinity in each of the ponds. And some of them had no salt because they were nowhere near a road. And some of them had more salt. And then there was one that had a ton of salt. And they took these nine ponds and then they collected tadpoles from all those ponds, and then they did these lethality experiments where they basically just kept adding salt to their water and to see where they died, to see what their sort of limit was for how much salt they could handle. And 
all the tadpoles from eight of the nine ponds were sort of at the same level for salinity of what they could handle. But then the ninth pond, which was the saltiest and had the crazy amounts of salt in it, those tadpoles were able to survive much more salt than any of the other tadpoles from the other ponds. And they believe that this is because over the last, say, 50 years, that pond has gotten so much salt through generations and generations and generations of frogs and tadpoles that they have been selected. So the ones that couldn't handle the salt have died, and the ones that happen to have a little genetic whatever, so they could survive a little bit more salt, survived. And over time, that population has become salt tolerant in a way that none of the other ones were. And so this is an example of evolution happening in just like a few decades. I have a theory about skin fungus. Go ahead. That relates to this. Tell me about your skin fungus theory. Well, I have tinea. I got, it's really bad on my back last night. I was looking in the mirror. I'm like, Miranda, she's my girlfriend. You got to come over here and put some antifungal cream on my back, which is one of the erotic activities that we do. But sure. I, I, I have these, med- these uh, creams that I get from the doctor. Wait, what's tinea? I don't know what that is. Tinea? Yeah, it's like the, the blotchy fungus you get on your skin. Okay. Tinea versicolor is the name of it. Oh, that's a genus. Okay, go on. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's the same family of fungus on the t te- on the feet. I think that's like tinea ped- peditis. Ped- ped- oh, okay, so like athlete's foot, it's the same thing, but it's just one that goes on a different part of your body. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Look up tinea. It's it's a ringworm. Ringworm. It's ring. It's a tinea and ringworm are like ringworm is a type of tinea. Oh yeah, there it is. Sexy. Oh, wait, no. I'm looking at tinea, the tapeworm. That's a different thing. No, no. Tinea versicolor. How do you spell tinea? T i n e a. Tinea. Uh, first color there it is first hit oh yeah oh yeah it's a common fungal infection of the skin yeah that's good don't want a rare one no so i get the cream i used to use turbinafin that's lamisil now i got a better one thank you doc but i i kind of i kind of treat it until it's not visible anymore but you're supposed to treat it for like a full two weeks okay and okay. i'll treat it for like five days it goes away and then i just give up and then right. it comes back six months later worse and I do the same thing. And then it comes back worse. I think the fungus on my body is super fungus. I think it's like I don't kill it off completely. So the ones that survive are resistant to the creams. Yeah, that sounds like what you're doing. That sounds like you're actually, if you wanted to make a super fungus, it sounds like that's what you should do is almost kill it so that like 5% of the population remains and then let that population grow back and then almost kill it so 5%. So you're you're basically doing uh, what they do in labs where they're trying to uh, grow things that are resistant to antibiotics. Uh, it won't be an antibiotic because it's a fungus, but antifungals, I guess. And then I scrape my tongue vigorously every morning and night and get all the plaque and bacteria off my tongue, but obviously I don't get all of it. And then and the next day, like by treating all these ailments on our body, are we actually making them worse for us? And then by the time we're 70, 80, 90 years old, our fungus... Is just like all over us and we can't control it. And, and it relates to these frogs because I, I keep on almost killing it off and then it comes back with fury. Right. Just like the salt. Yeah. 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 It's like throwing salt on the wound to mix metaphors. I, yeah. I, uh, I don't know anything about how to treat tinea versicolor, but I do know that when it comes to antibiotics and bacteria, you're really not supposed to take the antibiotics for, you know, half the time and then stop because then you'll definitely have it come back and it can come back and kill you. Like it can be really, really bad. And that's where a lot of these resistant strains come from. And it's a massive problem when people don't finish their antibiotics because they don't kill it off because you don't quite kill it off with antibiotics. Like your body has to finish the job sometimes, but you have to get the population down far enough that it can do that. And if you don't finish the antibiotics and it does come back, there's a good chance you've got a strain now that's resistant to the antibiotic you used. And so that's, that's not good. Um, but I don't know how that fits with the fungi stuff. And I don't know what that does in the long term in terms of like when you're 70, 80. But um, maybe you should finish taking the cream. As long <laughs> maybe as I should now that I think about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just a visual. Like there's nothing wrong. It's totally benign. Like it's just uh-huh. a skin. Look, yeah. I don't have athlete's foot. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, but you don't want it. No. Well, I have the opposite problem with athlete's foot. Um, my girlfriend, she'll be embarrassed for me to share this, but she got it once from, you know, shower at the gym or whatever. And I didn't get it. And I have these perfect feet. I have beautiful feet. Honestly, I should really? start an OnlyFans where I show off my feet. Like, that's how good Why? they are. You should do that. Can you do that? Is like part of your, like, shtick for your radio segment. And every week you tell us how it's going with your OnlyFans for your feet. I want you to do that. <laughs> Only feet. Uh, it'd be OnlyFan because there'd just be one of them. But yeah, um, but they would really like your feet. Go on. 
But I shared a shower with my dad as a kid, and my dad, he claims it's, oh, I played so much hockey and da-da-da. Uh, I just got a text message. I'm an athlete. I just got a text <laughs> message. You're outing me for my athlete's foot. My girlfriend is eavesdropping from the other Oh, room. no. It's treated. Hi Miranda. Hi, Miranda. Dan says, and it's treated. Not important. I shared a shower with my dad, and he had these horrifying feet. And I think my immune system is like a three, four-year-old got trained against the worst possible, most cream-resistant athlete's foot strain that I think plagues him to this day. And then he'll like treat it; it'll come back. Same thing that I have with the skin fungus. And so, as a result, my feet almost never get anything, and they're perfect. And when other people use my shower and they got foot fungus, I don't get it. I have the opposite problem. I- I'm trained on a super fungus, right? Uh, my immune system. So that's that's my. I just I love fungus, Dan. Yeah, you're a fun guy. You know what's funny is that you're you twice. You said I shared a shower with my dad. Both times, I imagine you were in the shower with your dad at the same time, and I had a lot of questions. But then well, I realized when you, now actually that when we were li- when I was little, yeah, when I was like three, sure, three, you- four years old, yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. And then when I was 35, 36, but I'm 37 sure, sure, now. Sure, sure, sure. You no, just got to catch up. I mean, I shared the the, the space. I shared the yeah. same shower. No, enti- you didn't share it at the same time. No. You just used the same shower. Yeah. That's how I should have put it. I used the same shower. <laughs> but I did. I, like both times, you're like, I shared a shower with my dad. I'm like, okay, it's close, yeah, close, 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 close. Whatever close. floats your boat, dude. <laughs> just picturing your dad like, boy, my feet are itchy. Get in here, kid. <laughs> 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 Don't forget to clean behind your ears. Man, my feet are itchy. That's how I pictured that interaction. Yeah, I have a lot of weird neurotic shower routines. I remember really? one time I was in, because I was like three or four, and I was using my parents' shower, and my mom would be like getting ready, wearing clothes, but I'd yeah. be in there. And so she, you know, she observed, this is maybe a little weird now that I'm no, saying it, but she, she observed me showering, and I, sh- I soaped my body, you know, I used a, yes. a bar of soap, uh, wiped, you know, so everything fine, and then I shampooed my hair, and my mom's like, you have to soap after you shampoo because the shampoo spreads all the germs over your body and if you if you do it in the wrong order that's disgusting and so i just had it in my mind that everyone did that and that was a commonly known shower routine the problem is when you take a shower and when you do your business on the toilet it isn't really an observed thing so you may come up with these routines or have these things you do that are normal that everyone's like what what it's soap shampoo is soap and you rinse it off who cares what order it's in yeah. I, you know and when you're an adult you start if maybe if you're lucky showering with someone of the opposite sex or if you're gay showering with someone and maybe of the same sex and then maybe you observe their routines and then there's something a little off you know it's yeah. uh, and so i saw miranda showering with the soap <laughs> you're about to get a text message you Go know on. i am i saw her showering with the soap before the shampoo i'm like that's disgusting and she's like why is that disgusting and i thought to myself I actually don't know why that's disgusting. It's, it's not. funny. Our parents tell us things and we just believe it forever. Yeah. Like, coffee will stunt your growth. It's like, I really believe that, but I don't, I've never seen scientific evidence of that. It's Smoking's bad for you. My parents always yeah. said that. Now they Exactly. What do they know? Yeah. I mean, they, they said they coffee was bad for you. Now they say it's good for you. Who knows? The toilet routine's funny because um, I talked to somebody who uses the toilet backwards because they they found what? that the back they of the toilet sit facing the tank that's because wild. they could use it to hold their magazine <laughs> they could put their their magazine on top of there and it would be really convenient to read and i think they knew that they were doing it differently from everybody else but when they told me that my mind was blown wild yeah and then there's the people that fold the toilet paper there's those people that roll it around the hand like yeah, a, yeah yeah and then there's the, like a honeycomb and then there's people that like scrunch they just scrunch yeah. it into a bow and then wipe with the bow. What are you not scrunchy? What are, you know? If you're a scruncher, Dan, you're a sociopath. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I'm not going to comment on my habits of how I use toilet paper. I do use toilet paper. I don't want anyone. Wait, to think you I won't don't, say but... how you fold it. I'm not talking about no. when it makes contact no. with your private area. No, I won't talk about it. You won't say whether you whether you roll over the hand, you fold neatly, or you scrunch. You won't even. No, disclose I think that. I'll leave that as a as a something for for the internet not to know about me. I once was talking to my mom on my show about this and i'm like mm-hmm. you have to look after you wipe i mean it's a disgusting thing but you have to know whether you're done wiping And my mom's like i don't look i don't look i've never looked i'm like i don't believe really? you we got into a fight over it really this rant is starting to make you uncomfortable no i like it i like it i like it. i feel like you've got you you finally hit your hit your groove yeah with the toilet paper stuff fungus uh, and I- toilet paper dan fine let's go back to showering forget the toilet there must be odd routines that people have that you know they think yeah. are normal. Yeah. Yeah, you, I guess. I, I mean, there, there are those moments you have by yourself that you're not with other people that, yeah, I've often thought about how pe- when people go into the bathroom, they really don't have any way to socially learn. Like, no social transmission of information there. Exactly. Exactly. 
like what do you have a specific order because i always do shampoo face soap body soap even though i now realize my mom was nuts when she said that's disgusting and unsanitary i but it's in my mind like i got a shampoo before i soap i don't use shampoo every time okay and i do use soap every time and i also shave most times you shave in shave the shower i shave at the sink yeah i shave in the shower okay it's where it's where you should shave the skin soft and is it all right well we've learned a lot today <laughs> but now that i'm realizing i'm supposed to go on the national news in about we're going to pre-tape in about two hours and i haven't shaved and i like to shave for the national news because once lisa laflamme told me that i should shave because i had stubble and i was like yeah you know what sometimes i feel like the stubble looks good and she's like no it doesn't <laughs> and i was like oh and so then after that like i know she's not on the national news anymore but um I feel like I need to listen to what Lisa... When Lisa LaFamme gives you advice, you take that advice. So now I, maybe I need to shave in the next two. I may have to go have a second shower so I can shave, so I can do this this appearance with the national news. If you shave without showering, you get the red spots, the blood. The yeah, I get end. that anyway. But yeah, I get I get a red neck for sure. Although I, <laughs> I did an appearance on Your Morning, and then I went upstairs because I do it in my basement, right? So it was like 7.30 in the morning, and I shaved, I got dressed, I did the appearance on Your Morning, and then I went upstairs, and Chubb was like, why is your neck covered in blood? <laughs> Oh, like no. oh no and then i turned then my mom texted me she's like how come you were covered in blood on your morning and i was like oh my god so i i that one has not i've not seen it yet but i think i accidentally went on tv with like blood all over my neck so i should really check before i go on tv sexy dan thank you for being here see you that's a wrap on dan now we're gonna talk about how a recent survey of gen z's or gen z's as they say in canada has revealed that they would not care if an influencer turning them on to a marketing campaign by a company was a bot was ai kind of wild looking forward to picking it apart with carmy levy in just a sec Carmi Levy, a man of the hour. Carmi, welcome to the show. I'm excited to talk technology sector stories with you. I'm excited as well, though I, I want to know what happens after that hour is up. Am I no longer the man of the hour? I'm a man of the next hour? I'm not sure. Leave the jokes to me, Carmi. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. I'll, yeah. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I tried. How have you been, my friend? I have been well. It's been a lovely week. Lots of crazy tech stories happening. So most days I just kind of wake up and there are uh, messages from producers and and uh, and editors are you know around the continent uh, looking for comments on things that I'm just learning about because they broke overnight. So it has been a really weird week in tech. A lot of strange stories. A lot of cyber attacks. Uh, a lot of weird AI stuff going on. But you know this is the stuff I live for. So I'm down. Cyber attacks. That's good for you, right? That's good. That's your bread and butter. You, Someone else. Cyber attack happens yeah, in the right. woods. Carmi's going to talk about it. Someone else's misfortune is my gain. I hate to admit it, but it's good for business. Schadenfreude. The Germans have a word for this. <laughs> yes. Do you know that they one? Word for, they have a word for everything, don't they? Yeah. Schadenfreude. That means the joy you feel from the misfortune of others. Which yes. I, I just love that concept. Only Germans would. <laughs> All right. So there's a story that you have about a new study that says that Gen Z's Mostly don't care if influencers on TikTok, on Instagram are people or AI bots. But I want to zoom up a little bit before we go into this specific story. Because I was having a conversation with my girlfriend last night about art, visual art and music. How if it's AI created, like that sucks. And she, she's like, well, I, I want to know the intention behind the work. I want to know the story behind the work, you know. AI created works of art versus real works of art, it matters. And I sort of was arguing, well, yes, it kind of matters in your own head. But if you can't tell the difference, like if you're just as moved by an AI piece of art and the story of how it was created that's sold to you, like a song or a voice or acting even, if you're sold that it really was deeply moving and you can't tell the difference between something created that's really created by a person or created by a computer, does it matter? I think the knee-jerk reaction to us, the way we grew up where works of art were created by humans, uh, the answer is yes. But I think in five or 10 generations, if you can't tell the difference, 
Does it matter? And then there's this wider conversation to be had about, well, are we living in a simulation? I feel like that's every <laughs> every university kid's dream debate after, after they saw the Matrix in, what, the 90s or the early 2000s? But, like, does the stuff actually matter if you're moved by it and you can't tell the difference? I know it's like, I, I feel like I'm panicked when i when i'm confronted with this possibility but if i can't tell the difference does it matter the answer to the question for me is i don't know if it matters and that's scary but i think it all comes down to you know why are we fans in the first place so when i hear a song that i like if i like the song obviously i'll i'll enjoy it and i'll i'll you know tune in i'll look for more from that artist but over time as i sort of dig into that artist's uh, library and i learn more about them what I'm really engaged with is yes, the music, but also the story behind the music. The you know, I think there are a lot of people who really like Taylor Swift's music, but I think the reason that she's a global uh, phenomenon is her story is so compelling. There's so many facets of how she came to be and the life that she led that a lot of fans are truly inspired not just by the music that they listen to on on a feed or you know you know on uh, you know when when she releases a new tune or a new album, but it's the who she is as a person, uh, the, the, the story of her life. And arguably, I think it's a lot easier to do if you're a human creator as opposed to AI. If it's AI, maybe it's a great tune, but there's nothing behind it to make me want to learn more, to make me want to dig deeper. Um, and I think it begs the question, what are we engaging with and who are we engaging with? Uh, and are we fulfilled? It's not just a matter of the content, but it's the context of that content. And I don't think we're at a point now, maybe a few generations from now, after we've sort of gone through a number of iterations of it, that will change. But I think for now, that human connection uh, is paramount. And I don't think AI can deliver it at that level. It's just a regurgitation of what's already been created. I agree. But two things here, the story behind the music, take Taylor Swift or, or any mm -hmm. musician that you become obsessed with and yeah. read about their lives and research their catalogs and read the liner notes from all their albums. <laughs> that could be a lie. You know, that could be something sold to you. This person could either be oh, a sociopath. Of course it is. It's all marketing, of course. And we know that, but, but, the, but working through that process is part of the act of being a fan. It's part of the value proposition. I know, but the, the people that you can become obsessed with the stories that are sold to you could be lies you know every now and again you get a ceo and someone looks into their their resume and they're like you didn't graduate from harvard <laughs> and then they get kicked off of a board i'm just saying we as people can sell lies and you can come to love people based on lies sold similar to the lies the second point that could be sold to you using a sufficiently good AI, which I agree we don't have, and we probably won't have in our generation. But these are questions that I think future generations are going to be grappling with. I think they are. And I think even looking at current uh, state AI technology, it has a propensity to hallucinate, to lie, to go rogue, uh, and to create content that didn't exist. You know, the lawyer who used Ch chat GPT to write a bunch of uh, court briefs, which he then submitted using citations to cases uh, that open that uh, chat gpt invented they didn't actually happen and he's in the process of being disbarred so yes but that's, know, the that's the current state of ai i just mean in the future when 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 a lawyer could do that and come up with actual real cited cases and stuff it will get better uh, and eventually that that hallucination problem will if if it isn't completely eliminated it'll be mitigated to the point that we can trust the technology uh to to be reasonably truthful uh but then you know the 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 question then becomes is it even interesting because none of this would exist if a human didn't have those or create that content in the first place ai doesn't create things from scratch it hoovers them in and then processes them to within inches of its life and it, it and the the, the the conceit here is that we call it generative AI, but really it's more regurgitative uh, AI because it's simply barfing back what we've already fed it, fed into it. If we don't feed anything into it, it has nothing to work with. Where's the interest in that? So, but uh, state, to interject we're, we're here, there. Carmi, let yeah. me interject. Art <laughs> is built on the works of the people you're influenced by. Like the talking heads, even sure. icon iconic class, iconic casts. Iconic class, yeah. Even people who stand out as outliers in art, they're still built on the works of people prior to them. Like sure. you don't get Larry David without Groucho Marx. You know, right on. you don't get like any rock band today without the Rolling Stones. You know what I'm saying? Like, sure, but but I certainly wouldn't put 
Larry David sitting in a chair and and watching a Groucho Marx bit and then crafting something on a notepad that then becomes the script for, you know, the next Curb Your Enthusiasm episode is, ve is very different than a bot reaching into Groucho Marx's pile of content and then simulating something that sort of kind of looks like Larry David uh, and hopefully it's good enough. That's not the same thing and that's not something I as a fan would have a, a remote degree of interest in. As an as an AI exercise, absolutely. But it does it light my fire as a creative? Not even close. Not yet. Not yet. And there's two things right. I want to say here. I think great work is part regurgitative, regurgitative and part generative, right? Like, right. you know, you don't get, my favorite comedian is, uh, you probably have heard of him but eric andre and he does kind of surreal abstract stuff you don't get him without like andy kaufman and so i think right. there's an element of regurgitative i can't <laughs> speak this. and generative <laughs> just um, say barfing and my can, other point that, right? is and back to the story here uh there's a study that says gen z's or in canada gen z's i actually heard someone on the radio say gen z's on canadian radio last night <laughs> unironically which i thought was so funny but uh there's a study saying they don't care whether influence influencers for brands are bots or whether they're um, real people. And I think it shows that future generations are going to approach this question of it doesn't matter if a computer created it. They're going to approach that question uh, a little differently <clears throat> than we do. Yeah, I don't think that the data isn't lying. This comes to us from Sprout Social, and they, 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 they were looking specifically into, would you trust a brand if you found out that they used an AI, uh, a, a bot, as a, as a brand influencer instead of a human? Uh, and overall, about a quarter of respondents were indifferent, and, and about a third said, yeah, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't trust uh, the brand. Uh, but when they looked specifically at Gen Z, uh, they found that half of respondents would actually be more interested in the brand if they found out that it was using an AI influencer and that fewer of them were concerned about the use of AI. So I think you're right. With each successive generation, they care less uh, and they're more likely to engage with a brand or to, or, to, or to not not engage with a brand if they find out that they're using AI to create those assets. But Here's the thing, you know, so, so great. So we're, we're influenced by previous artists. What happens when we get 10 generations down the line and new artists are no longer creating comedy because it's all AI generated, that all the music that we're listening to is generated by AI, which was at some point, many decades previous was based on some human writing a song. But ever since then, it was just thrown into a database and it was just reconstituted again and again and again by the algorithms. What happens then? At what point do we lose sort of human input into the creative process and there's no human input to be had that kind of terrifies me because eventually it's all machine and we're going to have to go back hundreds of years to the point where humans were actually involved in the process at all and at that point i don't think i want to be listening to the music because frankly i won't really care one of my favorite things as a fan is to walk down a street or to you know hang out at a at a at a, at a concert hall after a concert and bump into members of the band and chat with them see them in a restaurant after word see your favorite sports player at a, at a baseball game uh, and have a conversation with them in the hall afterward if they're so inclined uh, or maybe they even give you the finger whatever it is it doesn't matter but you still had a moment with them take that humanity away and what is the point where are else are you going to engage with artistic creators when the only artistic creators are all algorithmically based fortunately it won't happen in our lifetime and and to the younger generation i don't think that question scares them as much um I kind of fear for their future. I, you know, if they if they don't care and eventually get to the point where they don't care at all, and it's clear that the data is heading in that direction, each generation cares less that it's not human. Uh, I worry about where that takes us, and I think it does open up some ethical and moral questions that are maybe we can leave that for a discussion for another day. Um, but I think it's taking us places we probably don't want to go. The older generation worrying for the younger generation. Now there's a pattern that's true and tried and tested in time. Carmi, we're going to come back with you in just a moment. I am here with Carmi Levy, technology expert extraordinaire. I think I announced someone yesterday, someone blank extraordinaire. Doesn't matter. Who cares? Carmi, welcome back. You're just like using that quasi French word because, you know, got that Canadian roots thing. There you go. I, at least I don't try to pronounce it like a jackass where I'm like <laughs> extraordinaire. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I moved from Quebec a quarter century ago, so I'm, I'm slowly losing that French side of my accent, but I can fake it every once in a while if people want me to. Let me know. Fake it till you make it. Okay, let's talk about GPS attacks, because I feel like people don't think about this, you know? Uh, there's hacking the device on your phone, which is like, okay, now people are tracking you all the time. But there's a much more kind of sinister attack where you're actually messing with the satellites or the technology itself to scramble GPS. Uh, this is all going on. This is not just fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD, as they say. This is, these are real attacks that happen, and tell me about them. There's been more and more reports of it. Yeah, we started seeing kind of snippets of it. If I, I look back in my notes, uh, I start, started seeing some headlines here and there. It didn't really get a lot of traction, but around 2014, when Russia invaded Crimea, Crimea and, and uh, took it over. So they used GPS jamming and spoofing. Jamming is, of course, where you, you block GPS signals entirely. Spoofing is where you try to fool GPS into placing uh, you where you're not. So, you would, you know, if you're in your car, for example, a spoof a, a jam GPS signal, you wouldn't be able to use Google Maps at all. A spoof GPS signal, you'd be sitting inland and it would look like you're in the middle of the lake 10 miles that way. So uh, we started seeing some scattered reports in 2014, but it really picked up uh, just over two years ago when Russia invaded Ukraine and was using GPS jamming as a, as a military tactic because we know weapons use GPS for navigation to target very precisely. And if you can if you can stop the enemy from using GPS, you can force their weapons to go blind or you can force pilots to use other forms of navigation. You, It's the fog of war. You mess them up. So we're seeing Russia use GPS jamming against Ukraine, Ukraine using GPS jamming against uh, Russia. And of course, that spills across borders all across the Baltic region. Uh, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Germany, uh, there are constant reports and they're getting worse by the week, so to, uh, seemingly, uh, that GPS just either isn't working or is working weirdly. Uh, we're also seeing that happen in the Middle East, in and around Israel and Gaza, uh, where, of course, we've seen military action in Gaza and uh, and use by G of GPS jamming and spoofing by both sides. So this is a thing that you and I you know, need to, to, to recognize because if it can be used there, it can be used anywhere. Uh, and we don't think about it when we get in our car, turn on Google Maps and, you know, get out and you know, go for a drive. We got rid of the paper based maps in our glove compartments years ago, um, but it really is not that difficult. It's fairly trivial to jam GPS signals in a region and cause a whole lot of inconvenience and danger for a whole lot of people. And taking it away from armed conflict, like in the Middle East or in Ukraine, you could do this for like economic conflict. You know, I think China, Russia, the US, they're too big to actually fight each other. But as they start to get along less and less, economic warfare, I think, is the main, the main thing that they end up doing. And China mm -hmm. could scramble GPS across the US or the US could scramble GPS across China. Uh, and it really would affect the economy, you know, like lo logistics companies, shipping, all kinds of things would be messed up and all kinds of modern technology rely on GPS. It's kind of frightening to think how easy it is. And, and we do know that there is active research underway in the US to harden the GPS network um, to, to build greater levels of encryption into the satellites that carry the signals, the ground stations, the networks, uh, and all of that to make it more difficult for bad actors, malevolent actors, state-sponsored resources like China or Russia uh, from compromising the network. Um, but nothing is perfect. Uh, and it's a, it's a geopolitical cat and mouse game with governments uh, trying to one-up each other uh, with every successive generation of technology. And, you know, caught in the crossfire are, you know, you, you me and, and everyone else. And all we really want to do is just get around in peace. Um, and we want to be able to buy things affordably. And we can't do that if the supply chain is affected by uh, GPS signals that are suddenly going batty. So um, it is uh, an increasing worry. And increasingly, we are seeing uh, electronic warfare uh, as kind of a form of quasi warfare. If China isn't going to be firing weapons at the US anytime soon, and certainly they aren't going to, um, they can certainly use lower level forms of electronic interference to mess with the with the economy with their supply chains, drive costs up, slow things down, uh, and and compromise us that way. And we can certainly do the same to them. And of course, because because this kind of activity doesn't simply stop at the border, doesn't say, hey, you're a military target, I'll target you, but I'll leave consumers out, you know, regular citizens, it won't affect them. It doesn't work that way. 
it affects everyone in a particular region. And as a result, we are incredibly vulnerable, even if it doesn't affect our particular smartphone or our particular car or our particular Garmin device. It doesn't matter. We'll pay for it one way or another. Got it. All right. Fun story. I mean, kind of scary story, but fun to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sleeping tonight. That's for sure. Let's talk about the ongoing TikTok ban because TikTok, I think they got a good law firm because I read the basics of the case. They are suing the United States about the law that was passed. And they're citing the U.S. Constitution. They're saying that this law to force TikTok to be sold to an American company uh, in the next year or something like that is unconstitutional. And they say that it violates something called a, a tainder or they have a right to not have a tainder. And I, I ended up looking this up. But basically, the U.S. Constitution says that the Congress can't pass a piece of legislation that punishes someone guilty of a crime without a trial. And it kind of makes sense, right? You don't want a Congress that passes a bill that says Carmi's a criminal, we'll throw him in a jail. Uh, you want that process to go through the courts. That should be a right of the people. Uh, the U.S. are really obsessed with the people, the people, the people, the people. We the people, you the people, I'm a people, we're all people. Of the people, for the people, you're a people. people. <laughs> Is TikTok a people? That's the question. Pretty smart people, though, because using the U.S. Constitution, quoting the First Amendment, saying this will compromise Americans' First Amendment rights to freedom of expression, that it is unconstitutional, is a masterstroke. From a Chinese company, which I love. They're using... It's like... And there's a huge amount of irony there, but but it, it, it works. And TikTok has shown for a Chinese company that, of course, they're owned by ByteDance based in China. I know, but this is a this is a single-party company where the lines between private and public are blurred, non-existent yeah. by the very structure of their government and how the country works. They don't care about irony. All they care about is keeping the lights on in the U.S. Well, it's just hilarious <laughs> that a communist country's company is suing the U.S. based on their constitution. It's like using your rules to beat you in your game. That's exactly it, because this is where the playground is. Uh, and they're not too proud to do that. And there's so much at stake here. This is a company with 170 million users in the U.S. Um, you know, the, the greatest level of levels of engagement and penetration of any social media platform, the greatest kind of what we call stickiness, um, the, the, the amount of revenue generated uh, uh, from a given level of activity, highest in the industry. Um, algorithm, it's acknowledged as the best in the business as well, most addictive most engaging so they have a lot to lose here and and certainly it whether it's ironic or not they'll they'll use whatever lever that's available to them and I, th I think it makes a lot of sense it it builds on what we've been seeing happen in montana the state of course uh pursued a similar uh piece of legislation to ban tiktok within its state borders um that of course tiktok also uh has challenged that in court uh and that is currently working through the court and serves as a precedent for what we're seeing happen at the federal level um, and so TikTok made it very clear they're not going to take this sitting down. They're going to use every legal lever available to them um, at recognizing full well that if the tables were reversed, it's not like an American company would have similar options in China. Uh, but that's the, you know, they're, they're happy to take advantage of that because it's available to them. And, and I expect this is a it's a nasty fight already. It's going to be even an even nastier fight as they pursue an expected injunction over the next few weeks. Um, and as that clock ticks down to next January, uh, which is when the deadline is for them to sell themselves or be subject to a ban. Um, so the, the clock is ticking. The question is, will this legal uh, process play out within that time frame, Or are we going to get to January right around the time when the administration is supposed to change? Um, and, and are we going to see an extension? What will the courts do uh, as the, the parallel court case and election campaigns uh, and election in November play out. Absolutely fascinating. We've never seen anything happen like this at this level in the tech industry. And I feel like I need to make popcorn and pull up a chair to watch. I love it. Schadenfreude, <laughs> the misfortune of the United States and all the TikTok users is your joy. <laughs> That's right. Just just start using Instagram more because um, yeah, Mark Zuckerberg will thank you. Uh, Zuckerberg. <laughs> Carmi, thank you for being here. Was, this was uh, fun. A spirited chat today. Great being with you, David. So great to be with you. Mwah! Every good show has three things. A tech expert, a science expert, and a comedian. We're going to check in with my friend Natasha Vinnick, a comedian who's in Los Angeles for the Netflix is a joke special. But more importantly, she's been traveling and she can't poop. We'll dig in. Here we 
go. I'm ready. You're ready. Natasha Vinnick, comedian, San Francisco-based. Featured in Netflix is a joke. You're going to get thousands of people attending your shows from this appearance. So many. And no pressure, but they got to attend tonight's and tomorrow's shows. So can you turn this around pretty fast? Yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> How are you? You look uh, good, effervescent, sparkling, smiling, well, whatever. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing okay. It's nice and warm down here. I love LA. I have a lot of friends down here. And so far, the shows I've done have been fun. How have you done in them? Um, good. I only had one, but it was great. It was packed. Uh, I have two more this week, and I had another show that wasn't like part of the festival and i went to one of the, the netflix parties one of the after parties oh uh, that jim must... gaffigan was very close to me standing uh, you stood near jim gaffigan very close he uh he didn't have the money to tip the the bartender so the woman in front of me gave the bartender a five uh, for jim gaffigan uh, sorry to talk about jim gaffigan but he doesn't seem to tip yeah i was once in an ice cream line and the guy in front of me turned to the people ahead of him and he said, I'm going to be back in 15 minutes. Can you hold my spot? And as he walked away, I thought, oh, that's Owen Wilson. Um, (laughs) And everyone was talking about him. It was at Byright in San Francisco, the one at Dolores and 18th. Uh Yeah. And then he came back at the very last minute to get his ice cream and he left a $5 tip. Okay. Uh, Well, first, when he came back in line, I said, excuse me, sir, I've been waiting to sort of start with him. And he did that thing that all celebrities do. They're like, oh, ha ha. And they sort of like address you, but not really. (laughs) And then turn away from you. You know, that's so funny. Like, it's a joke. Like, it's a joke that you'd be actually asking for something. Yeah. (laughs) It's like they they give you that tiny bit of acknowledgement that you need and then they shut it down and turn away. Yeah. You know? And then I tipped ten dollars instead of five because the staff were like, "Ooh, he tips five dollars." So I made a big deal of tipping ten, and I showed everyone in line I tipped ten, and I said, "Look, I tip more than an international celebrity," and nobody laughed, and the staff were not impressed, and I'm down ten. Wow! Bucks. Yeah. yeah, you should have pulled that ten bucks back and been like, "Never mind then." So I guess in my experience, tipping more than celebrities doesn't really get you anywhere in life. So that woman was ill advised. Yeah. It was a goofy move on her part. And she was one of those people who, like, we didn't know each other, but we talked to each other because I guess I looked like a friend of hers. And I did the move you do where you go, hi, I'm Natasha Vinnick. And you shake their hand, assuming they'll tell you their name back. Hate that. She did not tell me hers. So then my dude did the same thing with her and she didn't tell him her name. And it's like, do you think you're so famous that we know your name? It was ridiculous it took a lot of conversation before i finally was like hey sorry what's your name again and she told me her name but i'm like how can you be so thoughtless to not do the rules we have a rule we all follow i say my name you say your name that's the law yeah and sometimes i'll introduce like miranda the code is when i when i'm near someone and i'm like this is miranda she goes hi what's your name because she knows i've already forgotten it's the cheat it's the best cheat you know and Uh, When people don't abide by it, it's so unkind. I said hate that before you went into your story. To be clear, I hate this woman, not you for introducing yourself with your name. No, no, I knew what you hated. You were on board. Did you get a haircut? Your hair looks like it changed. I mean, probably. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Sometimes it's greasy and it just looks smaller. So you went to this party. I've never been to a fancy after party. I guess I've been to the one in... um. San Francisco. What's that comedy festival? Sketchfest. Sketchfest. <laughs> Love Sketchfest. Yeah, it was fun. There's a lot of free food at this one. I like that. And a whole swag bag, silly swag bag. Ooh, famous people, celebrity party swag bag. What is in those? Um, it's a tote bag that says Netflix is a joke with a shirt with huge copy on the back that says Netflix is a joke festival. Uh, a beanie. Wacky socks. The only thing I've ever attended with celebrities, I got a swag bag and it was just chocolates and a beanie. Yeah, beanie is key, I think. Beanie is part of it. I guess. Yeah. Beanie is part of it. It is. Okay, so the festival, so the party was whatever you, you know, who cares? You stood near Jim. I get get stressed out at those because I think that you have to be productive Mm. and I'm not good at being productive. I'm not a good schmoozer, a networker. But I think people who are good at that have a productive time where they're getting something out of it. And that's just not 
my style, unfortunately. Well, it's a tough one, right? It's a fine line. If you're too schmoozy at a party where there's people more famous than you, they see right through you and you come off as desperate. Uh, if yeah. you're sh- the right amount of schmoozy, it can go well. But if you play it safe and you're not that schmoozy, you save yourself embarrassment. It's true. It's true. So I'm just trying to remind myself, just like, have fun. It's fun that I'm here. And that's me. And that's enough. You know? I mean, you stood near Jim Gaffigan. I was once on the other side of the street as Anderson Cooper. And I saw him on 6th Avenue. I mean, is wow. that? I'm pretty famous. Dude. That's the same. We're not so different from each other. I mean, standing next to Jim Gaffigan and across the street from Anderson Cooper, those are equivalent experiences because yeah. Anderson Cooper's a better a better um, person to, to be associated with, but I was further away, you know? Yeah, it's proximity that really, you know what's more delightful about Jim Gaffigan being there is he happened to be standing, and I like to think it was on purpose, under a photo on the wall of himself. Love it. <laughs> I hope it was on purpose. I think that's a funny bit. We can only hope to aspire to that. Like your photos yeah. in the green ro- green room of a famous comedy club, and you just stand by it until the call time. Near it. Yeah, I think it's good. It's good stuff. Love it. Okay. Well, more importantly, so the show went okay. You made people laugh. All that kind show of was stuff. great. Yeah, absolutely. I was very happy with it. <sighs> but more importantly, you haven't taken a crap. You haven't taken a shit. <laughs> Are you there with your boyfriend? Yeah. Is that the problem? No, I think it's different bathrooms. So it was four of us in a place with one bathroom. That'll do it. And 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 the toilet's very far from the ground, which is fine for them because they're both tall. But I need more bend in the legs to be productive. Do you know what I mean? You're like a little kid in a booster seat with your legs dangling. <laughs> <laughs> just swinging. You can't shit when your legs are swinging. My God. You just can't. No, no, you can't. <laughs> swinging shit. Can't do it. No, you need to be grounded, you know? Well, do you get this a lot? Traveler's constipation? Sometimes, yeah, I guess so. I like having a squatty potty. I'm a squatty potty gal. I'm used to legs being high up. Uh, so, yeah, I have. I wasn't, I wasn't shitting for days. And they offered me their cat's laxative. Their cat's dead, but it was a <laughs> laxative the cat took. Is it good for humans? Well, it turns out it's just Miralax. Uh, so I bought some of that recently. Oh. Um, but I have this thing where I'm not, and you could, you probably have experience with this because you also are a weird tummy boy. I am, um, but I skew in the other direction. I skew in the too much flow, not not oh, enough. Oh, you're flow. a liquidy boy. I'm a liquid boy. Yeah, I'm, I'm Aquaman. Yeah. I'm all stuffed up. I'm all stuffed up. Uh- <laughs> so I can see it. You opened your mouth when you laughed just then, and I could see it in the back of your throat. That's how. That's disgusting. Yeah, it's, that's what we've been saying. I've been saying I'm filled to the brim. I've been telling everyone I'm filled to the brim. I'm filled with. <laughs> <laughs> all the way inside of me and so a lot of people are like take some laxatives or like miralax but i have this whole thing in my head that like that the laxatives affect the stuff you're gonna make but don't affect what you've already made do you know what i mean i think that's a whack theory i don't think there's any basis in science but you should continue to believe it how does it affect the stuff that's already made yeah, you're falling victim of a, to a fallacy here where you can't think of how it would work, therefore it works the way you think it works. And I, th- the answer is I don't know. I'm just yeah. not convinced that it doesn't take the poop that's already formed and I'll liquefy it, like like adding you water. You think it does stuff to what you've already made? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I've never taken a laxative, so I, I can't speak to But I know. Oh, yeah, you don't need to. <laughs> you no. need to bulk up in there. Miranda has because she can't doesn't do well in adversarial pooping conditions like when she's traveling with a group of people and uh, they're fighting over the bathroom. That's why it's adversarial for her. It's like she doesn't want them to know she's pooping, you know, oh, And even if yeah. she says I'm going to poop now. The fact that they know she couldn't do it, you know, so she's she struggles. She struggles. Yeah. Yeah. You can relate We're to very that. open, me and my dude, about our pooping thing. We tell each other that pooping's happening. You got to do don't spend enough time in there, but like. You don't want to spend too much time because it breaks your butt. Yeah, you can get hemorrhoids from sitting down there too much. I've had hemorrhoids before, so I try to be careful, you know, about my poop sitting. You got to have an open line of communication about poops with your significant other. Life is too, yes. life's too short not to. That sounds like a horrible yes. and stressful way to live. Yes, I agree. It couldn't be me. I, I need to be like, I'm doing a thing. I usually say I'm going to do a thing there. I'm going to do a weird thing. I don't necessarily say poop, but we know what's happening. Very clear. I just realized we've had this conversation time and time again, and you and I know what my thing is that I say to Miranda, or at least used to. And when we come back from this short break, (laughs) I'm going to drop the bomb on what 
a poop is between me and my girlfriend. And we are here with comedian extraordinaire Natasha Vinnick. Me. Uh, I do want to say I love that I feel like at least a quarter of our conversations are shit related. They are. They definitely <laughs> are. And I remember having this conversation with you for the first time, telling a story about how when I first met Miranda, we spent the night in a hotel because I didn't want to stay mm-hmm. in her dorm. That's how young she was. I was also young. Okay. I was like 26. Okay. I hope so. This was a bummer to hear for a second. <laughs> I was 26 and she was 21. Okay. I mean, I, you know. Okay. That's not weird. I mean, it's a little weird. It's not weird. She might have been 20 and I might have been 26. It's weird. I was 58 and she was 14. Okay. Normal. Normal. And I had to go because I have IBS and I have diarrhea all the time. So I went to the bathroom in the lobby. But I said to her, I'm going to go send a fax. I love it. I love I'm going to send a fax. It's so good. And you gleefully described that as a butt fax at the time. <laughs> yeah, it is a butt fax. <laughs> I'm picturing like the old offices with the photocopier and someone would photocopy their butt, but maybe on fax uh-huh. mode, you know? I like that. Uh, yeah, when uh, so when we were in the house with the two other people, when I was super constipated before I took the cat lax, um, I kept referring to me like starting to get a little poop out as a, I, I'd say, hey, just so you guys know, there's a surprise drop. Because I've made all this stuff. I've done all this making, but I haven't dropped it yet. You know what I mean? Like an album. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a drop. Line. Yeah. I let them know I'm doing my drop. Uh, so that's been a fun bit we've been doing. So you got a little bit out. You got to be careful. You can get hemorrhoids from pushing too hard. I know. I've had hemorrhoids, you know, but uh, I, you got to push out what you can, but you don't want to saturate the market, you know? You don't want to burst a, a, a blood vessel. It's weird when you really push, you really feel it in your head, you know? And I'm like, what? This is yeah. not, a, not a normal feeling. Yeah. And I'm just there wiggling my legs, trying to push something out of my butt. It's crazy. <laughs> On this way too high toilet. Who puts in a way too high toilet? What kind of house is this? It's got really high ceilings, so I guess it all makes sense. They just stretched out the whole place. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. When you do high ceilings, yeah. you got to do a high toilet. Every interior uh, designer can tell you that. It's proportional. Well, I look forward to you pooping. I, how many days has it been? Because after three or four for me, I get real stressed like. I got a little bit of business out this morning and a little bit of business out yesterday. But you still feel that thick, like petrified wood feeling in your stomach. I feel like I'm made of shit. I feel like I'm just filled with shit, okay? Uh, and I've been here for about a week, so it's been a lot of... I've been considering a suppository even, you know? I've been... Do it. No. Live I stream it. it. <laughs> that's true. I need a job. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> there it is. I mean, that's got to be on OnlyFans. Uh, that's for sure, on OnlyFans. And if it's not, I could do that. I'd be willing to do that. Yeah, Natasha Vinnick, live stream suppositories. Yeah, exactly. You could just have your butt and you could wear one of those privacy things on your front and on your boobs, you know, be covered up. The only thing that shows is the hole in the suppository. Yeah, that's all. And just only hole. It can't be bad if it's only hole. It could be any hole in theory. They won't know. Hole's a hole. Can't get a dude's butthole pregnant. Yeah. But you can get a ladies, right? I assume that's what my brother said to me when I was born, that I babies are sometimes born out of the vagina, sometimes out of the butt. My brother told me I was a butt baby. You're for sure a butt baby. And he, my parents, they're like, you were an accident. And so he said, his mom just pooped you out. And she didn't even realize. (laughs) I love that. Siblings are so mean. And there I was swimming around in the toilet like a tadpole, Natasha. Yeah, just holding on to a a piece of shit just floating i love what we've done today (laughs) yeah i'm so sorry (laughs) no i love it i love it today's show is of all the shows definitely one of them now the festival two more shows most people send in their stuff to netflix as a joke oh put me on stage and they're like yeah maybe maybe not but you got scouted is that hard to you got to live up to that reputation of the scouted comedian you know, between you and I, there are a lot of comedians at this festival. Uh, there are a lot, I think everyone was scouted here. I don't know if anyone, like, I think everyone was asked by folks. But you're right. It's really cool that they asked me to audition to be on this. Way to diminish it. Gotta cut it I'm down. I'm so sorry. No. I just don't know how to. Cut it down. You suck and I suck and everyone no. sucks. And that's the best way to be. One day I'll have the bravado that I need to have and be like, yeah, they is in me you know but that's after i remove all the from my body or you won't 
Because for me, the the pessimism, the self doubt, the thinking everything I do is terrible, it's followed me around. Like if I listen to what I did five years ago into a mic, and then what I do now, it's objectively better. It's smoother. It's cleaner. It's got I won't say it has a point, but it has more of a point. It's got everything that I wanted five years ago. Yeah. And in a way, I feel worse about it now than I did then. Because then there was like, <laughs> you know, I suck and I know it. Now I'm supposed to not suck and it sucks or to my ear, it sucks. So I guess yeah. what I'm trying to say is that negative self view has gotten to you, has gotten you to where you are today. It w- may well follow you around yeah. when you're playing Madison Square Gardens to 7 billion people. I can't wait for that day. Madison so Square Garden or Madison Square yeah. Gardens? Uh, I, I don't know. And I'm sure 7 billion people do fit in it. They do, yeah. Garden. Yeah. Singular. Going singular on that one. Okay, good. I should know. It's like, what, 20, 30 blocks from here? Whatever. Who cares? Uh, The self-doubt. I tried to have a deep conversation. Let's just talk about the poop. So you might get a suppository. Okay, good. No, I'm not. I won't. I won't. I'm going to figure it out myself. And you never answered my question. I said, how many days is it? You just said you got a little bit out twice today, but how many days since? I said, I've been here for a week. A week? Yeah. You haven't pooped for a week. I got a little bit out a couple days, but like we're beginning the process. Oh no. And I just keep eating more and more food, hoping that it pushes it out. <laughs> I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> I hope it's how it works. I once heard that if you compressed all the empty space in all the atoms on earth, it would be the size of like a period on a piece of paper. So maybe you can just keep putting food in your body. And you want to explode. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to keep compressing like a brick. Uh, and that's what we want. I talked to a proctologist about this and they said they go in there with like a little spray tool and they like break it up a little bit. And then you, maybe you should see someone. Oh, for when you're impacted? Yeah. Yeah. Fecal impaction grandma, is no joke, dude. It can kill you. I know. My grandma always worries about it. When I haven't pooped for a while and we talk about it, she's like, you're going to be impacted. You can go from just constipated to full sepsis, okay? You can get a blood infection from it. You can die. I'm pooping a little bit, okay? Are you pooping enough? I'm pooping a little bit today, a little bit yesterday, we're on it, and I'm taking the cat laxative, okay? (laughs) Cat lax. (laughs) It's all happening here for me. Oh, no. Well, if you get a fecal impaction, that'll be good uh, source material. Material, Yeah. yeah, exactly. I know a proctologist in the LA area if you want to talk to someone okay that's good to know he'll charge you he doesn't know me that well but I know him oh boo yeah boo <laughs> and what do your friends oh. and boyfriends say are they worried about you are they saying you're fine I mean what what's the consensus here you're gonna die no one's worried about impaction but in their defense none of them have a lot of um medical problems where I think they they would be concerned. They're just like, oh, we got to get you laxatives. You got to do laxatives, you know? Take the laxatives. I'm taking the cat lax. But are you taking a human dose? Yeah, duh. I'm not taking the cat dose of cat lax. That's crazy. I'm a human. I'm looking forward to this. Can you maybe send me a photo when it's done? <laughs> not kidding. Please of the stop. poop? Of the poop. Okay. Um, I've been offering, uh, but no, no, no takers yet. I, my friend Dan and I used to send each other poop pics. Um, I think you should. I think that's friendship. Like with the be selfies on the toilet, like with the genitals and the poop. Yeah. Yeah, the whole thing. Does everyone look at their poops? Yeah, I mean, you have to, right? I think so, but I don't know if everyone agrees with us. What if there's like blood in your stool? That's what I mean. You got to know what's happened. You got to see what you made. You got to see what you made. In yeah. Ger- have you ever been to Germany where they have those poop shelf toilets? You know what I'm talking about? No. Oh my God. They're like a two stage toilet where you basically poo on a shelf that has no water on it. And then it flushes down with high pressure into the like hole, the holes towards the rear of the toilet. And it's, you just, they stink because your poo's not submerged, but apparently they're so you can inspect your crap because that's what Germans need to do. Why do they need to do it more than us? They feel that it's a part of hygiene, regular hygiene. German poop shelf toilets. Look it up. It's a thing. It's wild. It's disgusting. When you say inspect, do you mean like touching? Are they touching it? I assume not. I think it's just a visual inspection. Why can't we inspect it in the water like us? I agree. I agree. Huh. You ever poop though and it kind of like bounces into the back and then you never get to see it because it gets swallowed by the, the plumbing before... 
Rarely. Yeah. Rarely. My poops, they stayed close to me. <laughs> That's called a ghosty, which is also slang for someone with nipples that don't have pink in them. They're just the color of skin or white. Ghost nipples. Ghosties. Well, I've never seen that. That's a real thing. I guess someone between the two of us likes pornography more. Natasha, what a joy. Yeah. Netflix is a joke. Tonight, tomorrow, just look her up. NatashaVinnick.net. Who cares? Who cares? Dot com. Dot com. Did you buy the dot net? No. Should I? I mean, no. I'll think about it. I don't think anyone's going to dot net anymore. That's a real 90s thing. No, it's embarrassing. As always, thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. And I should probably mention, thank you for your time, listener. Thanks for tuning in. What a week of all the weeks we've done this show. This was definitely one of them. See you Monday.